looking good. You know what my wife said? We came here for the funeral a few weeks ago. After the funeral was over, I called her and I said, well, <clears throat> what'd you think? She watched it live streaming. She said, well, I thought your part was good. I said, okay. She said, I thought Brother Jim did good. She said, the star of the show was the pastor. The star of the show was that guy right there. She said, he had the best message and he had life. He had connection with the people. And she said, Brother Jordan did the best of all of you. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> it's so good to be here with you today. I know that <clears throat> this church has been through some crooked trails. But I believe that the trail is straightening out. And I believe it all began when Brother Jordan was anointed and took the mantle up to become the pastor of the church. I believe that things are going to begin to straighten out. I love all this. Yeah, go ahead. I have nothing but the highest respect, and I'm not going to keep you but just a moment. I have nothing but the highest respect for this church and for this family because, boy, to lose Brother Cecil, which was a major loss, and then to lose Pastor, I mean, that, that's more than a lot of churches can take. But, you know, knowing Evangel like I know Evangel, you're going to take that in stride. You're going to move ahead and become greater than you've ever become. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. I, there's many things that I could say today. If you could give me a little bit more up here on these monitors, just a tad more, I'd appreciate it. This message that I'm going to preach this morning it will be back in the back after I get through today if you'd like to get a copy of it. We didn't bring many with us. But it's just one CD. I have a message today that I'd like to preach. You cut me down a little bit now. <laughs> I have a message that I'd like to preach today. I felt like this is the message that the Lord wanted me to speak. I was going to speak on it tonight, but I felt like the Lord said, no, I want you to move it to Sunday morning. There's a lot of things that's going on today in our nation and a lot of people are talking conspiracy theories. How many of you has heard some of them? I have too. Some of them worries me. And I think some of the prophesying that's going on today is conspiracy theories. Rather than real true prophecies in many cases, not all cases. But conspiracy theories... There's a lot that we hear about them, and there's all kinds of them. But most of the time, I think that they're a product of a wild imagination. So I don't want you to be distracted by these conspiracy theories. And um, not much is going to come from them, for sure. But there is a conspiracy that I want to talk to you about today. And this one is in full swing. And what I'd like to title my message today is A Conspiracy of Interruptions. A Conspiracy of Interruptions. This conspiracy is real. It should concern you. I think that you need to hear about this today so that you can be prepared and that I can be prepared. And you might say, well, what is a conspiracy of interruptions? Well, it's real. It will happen to everybody in this house. It is satanically inspired. It's hatched in hell against you. This conspiracy is planned against you. And it's very effective. It's one of the most effective tools the devil has ever developed. And... Satan is behind it all, and he uses his demonic imps to carry out this conspiracy against you. So, let me just start off by saying this. Who are the three main targets that the devil aims this conspiracy at? 
Number one is for those who are sold out Christians, the people that have set their heart to go after God, they've made up their mind they're going to go after God with all their heart, all their mind, and all their strength. You're going to be one of the first ones that's going to experience this conspiracy of interruptions. These people have purpose to follow close to Jesus. They see the day approaching. They know that the time is short. They're making up their mind to put off some things and to draw near to the Lord. And they have sold out to God. And hell is terrified of Christians that are going after God and they're sold out to God. Hell's terrified of those people. The second group of people is people of prayer that will experience this interruption. These people are the ones that the devil specifically is going to go after because a powerful praying Christian that's sold out to God makes their praying sounds like thunder in hell. When a powerful Christian that's totally sold out, they put everything behind them. They have their families, they have their jobs, they have their livelihood, they have their life. Understandable. But they put other things behind them, things that used to cause them to trip up. And they're going after God. And the second group is the people that have made up their mind to pray. And they made up their mind that they're going to become an intercessor and be available to God day and night to pray. And when they hear that unction of the Holy Spirit in their spirit, they're going to make their way toward the prayer chamber. And powers and principalities and rulers of darkness quake when sold out Christians pray. Believe me, they do. The Bible said the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And the third group that the devil's going to go after are those that have made up their mind to go after God for revival. The thing about Brother Gary that I love so much is he came to Brownsville a lot and he brought people from this church to Brownsville and they were powerfully touched. You can cut me down a little bit here if you want to again. And they were powerfully touched and they would wait even out in that line Outside, where people would gather early in the morning, even before daylight, they would gather by the thousands to come into that church and to experience the presence of God and to experience revival. The third group of people are people who are contending for revival. That was Brother Gary. He contended for revival. He was not a pretender. He was a contender. And revival involves the glory of God. It involves the manifest presence of God. In revival, people are not only saved, but they're delivered from demonic spirits. And they also are healed. And the glory of God makes all the difference in the world. And Brother Gary knew that, and he wanted revival in his church. That's why he invited me in the first place to come here. He wanted revival to come to evangel. And he contended for revival till the last day he was on the earth. So this conspiracy of interruptions is going to specifically fight you. Not only have you lost your pastor, but now you're setting your heart for a new year. You're setting your heart to go after God. You're setting your heart to be a prayer intercessor and a prayer warrior. And now you're setting your heart for revival. Beware of the conspiracy of interruptions. And I want to talk about that word for a few minutes, interruptions. So there are several tactics that I'm going to talk about today that the devil is going to use against you as you pursue these things that God has placed upon your heart. I believe today people are more hungry than I have seen them even before revival broke out at Brownsville. I believe that today people are sincerely hungry or something more. They're hungry for something more than just worship and preaching. They're, worth, they're, they're hungry for something more than just fellowship and get-togethers. People today are starving for the presence of God. And I want you to know God is anxious to pour out his spirit among us. 
And you know, when people go to church today, most people leave not dissatisfied, but they leave unsatisfied. What do I mean by that? They're not dissatisfied with the pastor. They're not dissatisfied with the church. They're not dissatisfied with worship. They're not dissatisfied with the get-togethers that they experience. But what they are is many times they come in and they get what they usually get, but they leave unsatisfied. Why are they unsatisfied? Because I believe God's putting it in the hearts of his people around the world. There's more, and I want you to experience more. I want you to feel that touch of the power and the glory of God. People would fly into Brownsville from all over the world just to sit in that atmosphere and to marinate and to soak in that atmosphere of revival. If they didn't care who the preacher was. They didn't care what was sung that night. They just wanted to come and sit and marinate in that presence of God. How many of you knows in his presence there is fullness of joy? And in his presence there's healing. And in his presence there's hope for tomorrow. And we need that more than we've ever needed it before. So what I want to talk about is the tactics for a few minutes that the devil will use in this conspiracy of interruptions to interrupt you. I remember when I first got in the ministry, I was telling pastor in the back room before we came out this morning, when I was 20 years old, I was right out of Bible school, and I was almost 21. I took my first church in Vidalia, Georgia, and um, Brenda and I had dated for about two years. We dated from the time I was 16 to the time I was 18. We got married when I was 18 years and two days old. She's much older than I am. <clears throat> she was 19. And I always told her she'd draw Social Security long before I did. But anyway, when we dated, she knew I was going to be a preacher. And she knew that I was really close to pastor and I prayed with pastor every night for years, even after I'd get off my dates with her, I'd go back to the church and meet pastor for midnight prayer meetings. I did that all during the whole time we dated and was going steady. I'd go to the prayer meetings after I dropped her off. So she knew I wanted to be a preacher. So I remember uh, I had preached around a little bit before I had Brenda, you know, as my wife and my girlfriend and all. I'd preached around places and I was trying, you know, I was doing the best I could. So I got an invitation to Ashburn, Georgia, right down there in Jimmy Carter country, peanut country. And I went down there, and uh, they invited me to preach. And you know what? I felt good about it. Hey, I got my wife with me, and we're married now. And I'm going to preach, and this is going to be the first time I've preached since I've got married. So I got down there, it was a country church, a little country church, they had the windows raised. They had a pretty good crowd that morning, it wasn't bad at all. And I got up and got to preaching, and man, I was struggling, I was struggling bad. I didn't do good. And matter of fact, when I was preaching, I was really letting them have it, you know, I was giving it both barrels, I was really preaching. I felt like, you know, man, if I just raise my voice and really get to preaching like I see pastor preach, I'll be okay. Well, I, I was preaching and, you know, I was sucking air and I swallowed a fly. <laughs> While I was preaching, I swallowed a fly. He sucked him right down in my lung, man, right down my esophagus. And I just said to the congregation, I said, uh, excuse me just a minute. And I went over to the window and I said, <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, like I was saying, glory to God, you know. And so after it was over, I got in the car, and um, I said to Brenda, I didn't even want to look at her. You know, I said to Brenda, I said, well, what'd you think? She said, honey, are you sure you're called to preach? <laughs> See, what that was, I had a destiny, and I was going somewhere. God had his hand on my life, but that day, it was a distraction. The devil had that fly there as a distraction to throw me off course. I did a horrible job. But how many of you knows even though things don't go well, you can't quit. You've got to keep on keeping on. Well, back in those days, I was playing the piano for a quartet. And we traveled around. We sang, you know, we had a good quartet. It's called the Ambassadors. And I played the piano for him, and I sang. I sang baritone. And uh, they invited us to sing 
at the um, homecoming at Riverview Assembly where Brother Wetzel pastored, my church, my home church. So I remember that morning our quartet sang, and I remember I was just that Friday after I got out of Bible college before I went in the ministry, before I went in and took my first church in Vidalia, Georgia, I was working for the Waterworks. And um, I had a good job there. Matter of fact, they did a survey and I was gonna get a very large raise because I was a lab technician. And uh, they were gonna send me to chemistry school and pay my tuition at chemistry school at Columbus College. So I had a new home, I had a new car, I had a new baby and I had a good wage, but I remember I was planting a tree out in my front yard of my house. I was planting a couple of trees in the front yard, and while I was planting the trees, I had tears running down my face. And I said, God, I'm so thankful for the way that you bless me, Lord, but I'm so lonely. I hurt so bad. I said, Lord, I look at this beautiful home, and I look at my beautiful baby, and I got a new car, and I said, Lord, why do I feel like I feel? Help me, Lord. And I just had tears dripping off my face. Well, that was on Friday. Well, on Sunday, I went to play play the piano for our quartet. It was homecoming. And Superintendent Aaron Wall was sitting on the platform with our pastor that morning. So as soon as we got through singing and playing, I was walking back across the platform and Brother Wall stood up, stuck his hand out, and he shook my hand, and he knew me, and I knew him. And he said, son, I have a question for you. He said, when are you going to get in the ministry? And I gave him the pat answer, when God opens the door. And so he said to me, well, I know where there's a door open right now, and I'm going to call him and tell him you'll be there next Sunday promptly at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So he didn't ask me. I didn't, he didn't tell me the size of the church. He didn't tell me the name of the city. He just said, I'm going to call him and tell him you're coming. I'll give you details later. Well, whenever I got there to the church that next Sunday, it was in Vidalia, a place called Tombs County, T-O-O-M-B-S, Tombs County. They had about 5,000 people, I think, in the county. And when I got there, the church was a dilapidated mess, And when I got there, I was sitting on the platform. The only time my wife had ever heard me preach, it was a total bomb. I'm sitting on the platform like I'm somebody. And they're going to vote on me that day to become their pastor or not become their pastor. And I'm sweating it because I don't know if they're going to vote me out and really humiliate me. So I'm sitting on the platform. And whenever... They introduced me to come up and they tell my name and they introduced me to come up. Well, when I stood up on that platform where I was sitting, when I stood up, I felt my head and my shoulders go into sort of like some kind of a fog or a cloud or something. And I felt a mantle come upon me. And as soon as I stood behind that podium and I began to talk, there was an authority that came There was an anointing that came, and even when I was greeting everybody, I didn't even sound like myself. God had brought me to my desired haven. I had made it, and everything that the devil ever used to distract me from the ministry was over in that moment. And here's what I want to say to you. If God has something planned for you, if God has a place for you, don't worry about your interruptions. It's only a sign you're on the right road. God is going to lift you up and God is going to use you powerfully. Somebody shout amen. amen. So number one, what are some of the things that the devil will use against you in this conspiracy of interruptions? Number one, it's unexpected situations that will just pop up. You've made up your mind to pray. You've made up your mind that you're going to go in and seek God. You've made up your mind you're going after revival. you made up your mind that you're going to do whatever it takes to get to where you really want to be with the Lord. And all of a sudden, just when you're really committed and things are going pretty good, Satan lets things pop up unexpectedly. Just pop up unexpectedly. 
specific strategy designed to rob you of your time with God and waiting before the Lord in prayer. A child has an accident. I remember when I first got in the ministry, the first month I was there, by the way, they voted me in that church. That was my first church. I was 20 years old. I turned 21 the next month, and they voted me in that church. The first month that I was there, I spent the first three Saturday nights in the emergency room with my wife and my son. The first night on Saturday night, before I had to preach on Sunday, he fell and hit his eye on the coffee table and split his eye open and had to get stitches. The next two Saturday nights, we was back in the emergency room and the emergency room technicians were laughing and saying, oh, you're back again. I spent three Saturday nights in the emergency room with my family because of accidents and it was nothing more than the devil designing interruptions and distractions trying to keep me from my study time and trying to keep me from my expectations of God delivering, me, uh, delivering a powerful message through me on Sunday and blessing that church and helping that church. And I had to sit in the emergency room sometime till two, three, four o'clock in the morning, go home, wasn't even finished yet with my sermon, and I had to preach that next morning at 10 o'clock. It was a conspiracy to distract me. And I want to tell you what I'm preaching. Many of you are sitting there saying to yourself, it's a conspiracy against me too. And you know that it is. Not only that, a pipe can burst in your house and there's flooding and it keeps you where you were trying to go. A fire takes place in the kitchen on the stove. Your dog keeps barking until you get up and go take him outside. Unexpected company comes in, unannounced. An unexpected phone call changes the dynamics of the entire night. A phone call. It was unexpected. The whole night turned. Something happens at your neighbor's house that demands your attention, and you and your wife have to go over there and intervene and help them because something came up. And already, as I'm speaking just on point number one, many of you are already beginning to understand exactly what I'm talking about because maybe already as pastor has called these fasting times and these prayer times, already you're having the same thing happen to you. It's laughable. It's predictable. It's laughable that these things are happening, but yet they pop up and they demand your attention. Number two, interruptions themselves are not evil. Interruptions are not evil, but the force behind them and the timing behind these interruptions is what is evil. It has an evil spirit behind it. The interruptions are not evil, but there's an evil spirit behind those interruptions that knows you, knows the vows that you've made to God, knows the promises that you've made to your wife and to your ministry, or to whatever God's calling you to, and that evil spirit is behind that trying to keep you from what you promised the Lord and what you vowed to do for your own self. The motive of the devil is evil. Satan even delayed an archangel, as I said earlier in this service. When Daniel was praying, the Bible says that the angel came to Daniel and said, Daniel, don't fear for from the first day you set your heart to understand, look at that, the first day that you set your heart, set your heart, look at that, to understand, you made up your mind, I am going to go in that prayer closet, I'm not going to leave until God gives me some answers, I am here for Israel, I am here for the Lord, we're in captivity. I've got to have some answers. And from the first day, this angel said that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before the Lord. It said, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the, 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 prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me and delayed me 21 days. Now think about that. It was an interruption in prayer that interrupted Daniel in his prayer time 
He's praying. He's expecting an answer. It was a delay, a purposeful delay for 21 days. Surely the devil thought after 21 days he'll leave the prayer closet. He won't care anymore. He'll give up. He'll walk out and he'll throw his hands up and say there's no use. But here's what I'm here to tell you today. It's worth it. Stay where you are. Keep praying. Keep seeking God. God is going to get the answer through to you. And let me tell you something else. Not only is the devil fighting you, but he's distracting the angels that's trying to bring the answer to you. So this conspiracy of interruptions is not just against you, but it's against even God's hierarchy of his angels. It's warfare. And it's a warfare of interruptions. Interruptions happen in the supernatural world just like they happen in the natural world. We got a glimpse of it through this scripture. From the time you set your heart, it said, from the time you set your heart, from the time I set my heart, hell knows it and hell goes to work and hell's gonna try to distract and interrupt. The third thing is this. Satan will use the interruptions and the distractions of human need to keep you out of what you promised God you're going to do. What do I mean by that? Just when you wanted to pray, just when you wanted to fast, just when you wanted to go after God for revival, somebody comes and they're needing a little of your time. They must talk to you. They're needing help. There's a crisis in the family. There's a crisis in the church. There's a crisis in your loved one, your relative, in the family, and they're coming to you and asking you in the time of human need, could you give us some time and could you counsel with us? Could you talk with us? It's so important to us. Satan will use the interruption of human need because if he can do that, you'll be torn between prayer and compassion for hurting people. You want to please people. You want to accommodate people. We all do. That's what we're called to do. Human need is something you can't ignore. Human need is important. Jesus, when he was here, this has always sort of shocked me to when I read this. When Jesus was here on the earth, the Bible said in Luke chapter 5 that great multitudes came to hear Jesus. It said great multitudes. If you'll read it in Luke 5, it says great multitudes came to hear Jesus. That means there were thousands of people that came out to hear him. And to be healed by him and to be delivered of demonic spirits. But the Bible says in verse 16 that Jesus would withdraw himself from the crowd into the wilderness and he would pray. He would spend time in prayer. He would withdraw from the needs of the people. They're out there by the thousands. The sun is going down. There's people that's still bound by demons. There's people that's still crippled. There's people that's still has children that has desperate needs. And Jesus pulled away and would not be distracted by human need. He pulled away, left the crowd down at the base of the mountain. He would go up into the mountain, go up into the wilderness, and he would spend the rest of the night with the Father. And I want to ask you something else. You know who Jesus was. I mean, come on, let's face it. You know who he was. Jesus was the Son of God. He was the second of the adorable Godhead. You have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father is the paternal. The Holy Spirit is like the maternal, the mother, because the Holy Spirit broods. The Holy Spirit grieves. The Holy Spirit's like the female. He's not a female, but he's like a female. He has the attributes of a female. The Holy Spirit grieves over people. Holy Spirit gathers people. Holy Spirit broods over people. And Jesus is like the brother. So you have the paternal, the maternal, and the brother. He's a brother that sits close. 
Now, Jesus is part of the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son. I want to ask you a question. If he's God, what's he doing fasting? Why is Jesus fasting? Let me ask you a question. Why is Jesus fasting for 40 days with only water? What's he fat? Why does he need to fast? He's perfect. He has no sin. Well, I have a question for you. If Jesus needed to fast, what does that tell you about you? I said, if Jesus needed to fast, what does that tell you about you? But now I have another question I want to ask you. Why, if he was God, did he pray? Why would Jesus pray? Think about it. Why? Why did he pray? I have answers for this. And if you'd like to get one of my series, I'll answer all your questions for you. <laughs> but I don't have time to cover them here today. But here's what I'm trying to say. When Jesus went into the wilderness, one of the first things he set his heart to go after God He's about to go into his ministry. The fame of him is about to spread throughout all the land. Jesus goes into the wilderness, and one of the first things is he's interrupted by the distraction of the devil coming to him. And the Bible said the devil took him. I guess the devil wrapped his arm around him and flew up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, look at all this. I'll give you all this. It was a distraction. Let me tell you this, the bigger the distraction means the bigger the reward. I said the bigger the distraction, if hell goes to the trouble of giving you a major distraction and a major interruption, you hang in there whatever it takes because there's a proportionate blessing waiting on you on the other side. And the devil took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, took him, the Bible said, took him up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, look out here. If you'll do this, I'll do this. So, as Jesus withdrew from human needs, he put the first thing first. Why would you think that prayer would be the first thing in Jesus' life? He's God. Why would that be the first thing? Why would fasting be the first thing in his life? He's God. But then the next day he would come back down and he would continue casting devils out of scores and hundreds of people and healing hundreds of people. But he would not be distracted. Listen to me before I leave this point. He would not, he would not be distracted from what was the most important thing even though it was important what people was asking him to do. You've got to learn. Listen, we've got to learn to one day turn our back and go to what's more important because how will he have the power to do here what needs to be done if he doesn't get the power when he's alone with his father? Are you listening? Number three. Number four. Interruptions can come Because of human flesh. <laughs> I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. One of the things that you need to realize is that the flesh joins in league with Satan to fight you whenever it comes time to pray. Now, hear me. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, and you live in a body. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, and you live in a body. The spirit, the way God made you is the spirit is to be king. The soul is to be servant, and the body is to be slave. Are you following me? You want me to say it again? Okay. The way God made us is we're tripartite, the spirit, the way God made, is 
when God made man, he made him both formed and created. Man has two developments that made man. God formed him out of the dust. God built him out of the dirt. And then God picked him up and breathed the Ruach of God into his body. And he became a living soul. The spirit, the Ruach part of God is the creative part of God that he breathed into you that makes you in God's family. So the spirit is to be king, the soul is to be servant, and the body is to be slave. Here's what happens. So many times Christians don't operate the way God made us. We allow the flesh to become king. We allow the soul to become servant, and we allow the spirit to become slave. I tell you what we need to do. We need to reverse this thing and go back and operate the way God made us in the first place and your spirit is to dictate to your flesh what your flesh is gonna do, not your flesh dictate to your spirit what it's gonna do. Now listen to this. This is very important. Interruption comes because of human flesh. Now, what do I mean by that? One important thing that you must realize as you're going to go after God, you're going to have to realize you've got an enemy in your flesh. You've got an enemy that's in league with Satan to interrupt and to distract you. Your flesh is going to cooperate with those distractions. The flesh, the Bible says, is enmity against God and it always will be enmity against God. So you must learn to not allow your flesh and give it that privilege of cooperating with Satan to get you out of your prayer chamber or to get you out of your commitment to go after God and to spend time with the Lord. Let me tell you what the flesh will do. The flesh will yawn. You can fish, you can hunt, you can do things you enjoy, you can shop, and not yawn one time. But you can say, I'm going into prayer, and before you get through the door, go, oh, oh, honey, I'll be, I'll be back after a while. You're already yawning. You know what that is? Your flesh is already rebelling against you and your flesh is saying, this is going to be boring. I don't want to do this. Oh, my God, don't drag me in there. Please don't drag me in there. And what's happening is, is your flesh is joining into a league with Satan, and your flesh is going to fight against you with everything it's got to try to convince you, don't keep me in here. Let me go. I'm preaching better than y'all acting, friend. Wild, fluctuating thoughts. I remember one time pastor told me the story about this girl and she was at the altar and she's seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She came so close. She had been close several times to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they were praying with her and they were surrounding her. She had some grannies down there. You know, the Pentecostal grannies with the buns in the back of the head. Listen, nobody can pray you through the Holy Ghost like a granny with a bun in the back of her head. And she's down there praying, this girl is, and she's come close several times, and then all of a sudden, she just quieted off. She just got quiet. And one of the little ladies said, honey, what's wrong? Are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. Well, they said, well, what's wrong? She said, I don't know. I just got to thinking about something. They said, what is it? She said, that the thought just came in my mind. Which side of a bull's ears is his horns on? <laughs> Which side of a bull's ears is his horns on? I have a question for you. What's that got to do with receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What's that got to do with anything? You're in church. What's that got to do with anything? See, what I'm trying to say to you is when you go and you start obeying God and you're hauling that flesh in to pray, that flesh is going to cause all kinds of wild thoughts uncontrollable thoughts. It's going to cause all kind of wild imaginations to rise up and to distract you and to keep your mind off of the things of God. And listen, I want to tell you something. If it wasn't possible to get a hold of the mind and pull the mind in subjection, the Bible wouldn't tell us to do it. 
You've got to reach up and grab hold of that mind and say, no, you're not going to do that. You're not going to think like that. Whoa. <laughs> Our minds wandering while we're praying. How many times has that happened to me? Our minds wandering while we're praying. And you're sitting there thinking while your mind's wondering, what good is this doing? And then all of a sudden you're praying and you remember something that you forgot to do. Somebody you forgot to call. And now you're all of a sudden thinking about cutting the time short because it's 9 o'clock at night and you realize you can't call somebody after 9 o'clock at night. I've got to go call them before it gets much later. And I'll finish praying after a while. And you know as well as I do when you leave that prayer chamber, you're not going back and finish that. That thought was a distraction that entered your mind. It's a conspiracy to get you out of that prayer mode. I want to tell you a funny story. I was pastoring Brownsville, and every year, this reminds me a lot of it right here because it's January. And I was fasting. And uh, usually every January, you know, I'd get along with God and I'd fast and seek God and for Brownsville, you know. And Man, I, I was fasting. I was proud of myself. I told Brenda, I said, Brenda, don't worry about fixing supper for me. You know, I'm not eating breakfast or dinner or supper. I'm just fasting. So I, told, I had to tell her because she's my wife. And I had to tell my secretary, Rose, that I was fasting. So I said, you know, don't fix anything for me. I'll be fine. So I had been fasting 13 days, nothing but water. I was weak. I felt close to God. I felt wonderful. So I left Brownsville that day, and what I was doing every day for lunch, I was leaving Brownsville, and I was going out and getting on uh, Cervantes, and I was going downtown Pensacola and going to the Bayfront Auditorium and I was parking in the Bayfront Auditorium there by the water and I was taking my lunch hour and I was praying and reading my Bible. You know, my fasting and prayer time. <clears throat> so this day, I pulled out from Brownsville and Mobile Highway is here and there's a little road that went off right behind a little pawn shop, a little side road and this guy's coming down Mobile Highway doing about 60 miles an hour. Well, he didn't have on any kind of uh, blinker or anything, so I pulled out, and just as I pulled out, he passed me, laid down on the horn, and was cussing me, and shot me a bad sign. You know what that bad sign was? He gave me the middle finger. Man, all of a sudden, I felt anger come on me. I felt anger come on me. I jumped out behind him, floored my car. Boom, I mean, all four barrels kicked up. Boom, boom. And I'm behind this guy, and I'm chasing him, man. I'm chasing him. I'm right on his tail. I'm mad as fire. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, what you going to do when you catch him? I said, I'm going to beat the ever loving snot out of him. And so when I heard the Lord say, what you going to do when you catch him? I said, I'm going to beat him. And then I caught myself. Amen. I'm 13 days in a fast. <laughs> and you know what I did? I pulled off side the road, Brother Jordan. I pulled off side the road and I said to the Holy Spirit, I said, oh, Lord. I said, I didn't know that was in there. You know what the Holy Spirit said? I did. <laughs> I did. It discouraged me so bad. I felt so much like a failure because here I am trying to be holy and sanctimonious and fasting and I'm doing good thing. I'm in good works, you know, and I hadn't eaten 13 days and I got so down on myself. I went and bought two double meat water burgers. <laughs> I went and bought two double meat water burgers, an order of onion rings, a chocolate shake, a Diet Coke, and an apple pie. 
And I got home that night and Brenda said, how did your day go? I said, interesting. <laughs> but now look here, what was that all about? What was that all about? If I could have stayed on that fast, and if I could have just kept on going, I was headed toward 40 days, but I made it to 15 days. And the Holy Spirit had this thing sort of set up where he just sort of took his hand away and he let the devil come in and create that situation to show me what was really in my heart and how my flesh had not really been conquered. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Ooh, come on now, y'all help me today. Yeah. And the flesh will get in league with Satan and demonic spirits to try to keep you out of what God's got for you. That's their purpose. They do not want you to pursue God. They do not want you to walk holy. They do not want you to sacrifice. They do not want you to pay the price because if you do, healing is going to increase in your life. Healings are going to increase in this church. The anointing is going to increase in your life and the anointing will increase in this church and the devil will do whatever it takes to keep you out of that special anointing. But I'm here today to tell you, do not be a victim of an interruption of this conspiracy. <laughs> Mental and soulish interruptions. If you let these go unchecked, they can totally lead you out of your prayer closet. Mental, mental and soulish interruptions. The scripture commands us Bring every thought into captivity. Another thing that you'll have to fight whenever it comes time to go after God is you'll have to fight boredom. Listen to me, everybody. Sometime prayer is like digging holes. Sometime prayer is like planting poles. Sometime prayer is like stretching wire. And then some time prayer is like pulling the lever and the power flows. Many times in my life that I have prayed, and I prayed with my pastor, the way he mentored me and brought me up, my dad left us when I was 12, and so I was called to preach at 14. My mother worked in a nursing home from 4 o'clock till midnight every night. And pastor, I was with him every night without missing a night for years. And he had midnight prayer meetings, and I still Prayed with him till like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. Went home, got a few hours sleep, and went to school. I prayed with him every night for four years. And so what happened was, he would teach us about what would happen to us when we started praying. And he said, all right, when it's time to pray, get the gum out of your mouth. I don't want to see you guys over there standing in the corner telling jokes. I don't want you all over there laughing. He said, I want you all to realize when it comes time to pray, we'll fellowship, we'll laugh, we'll tell our stories, we'll do those things before the time to pray. But when it comes time to pray, we've got to be serious and we've got to get serious before God. That's the way he trained us. He taught us about the different kinds of prayer. There's eight kinds of prayer. He taught us about all eight kinds of prayer. And then he taught us how to do them. He actually mentored us how to pray in those eight functions of prayer. But one of the things that I noticed was I had to battle boredom. I had to battle boredom. I had fun as long as we were eating at the cafe. I had fun as long as we was laying on the floor telling stories. But when it came time to pray, it felt like nothing was happening. It felt like nothing was moving. It felt so sterile. And it felt so boring like Oh my God, it felt like the prayers was coming out of my mouth and falling down the carpet. And pastor shared this with me. And he said, son, sometime prayer is like digging holes. And when you leave and go home at night, you were digging holes, but you didn't really sense a powerful anointing. You didn't sense breakthrough, but you were digging holes. It's business. Prayer is, prayer is work. You're digging holes. Some nights you come in and pray and you're planting poles. You're putting poles in those holes. Some nights you come in, you're tamping the dirt around those poles in the holes and you're fixing it to where 
You'll come in for a while and then you'll be stretching wire from one pole to another. And then there's going to come a time that you'll come in and everything will be connected and you'll pull the lever and the power will flow. Answers will come. So the boredom that I was feeling had an explanation to it. And I realized I'm working, I'm doing the work of the kingdom, I'm doing the work of Christ, I'm doing the work of the church, and I didn't really see anything tonight, but I was digging holes. And then I also came to realize I was planting poles. Then I came to realize I'm stretching wire. And then finally, 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 after maybe months, weeks or even months, the lever was pulled and an answer came and the power came. The anointing broke the yoke. And it helped me to understand that prayer is work. Prayer is not excitement always. Prayer is not always having some kind of an, a, an assurance that, boy, you know, this is doing great. You're doing great. Everything's great. Something's about to happen. You may be days away from it or weeks away from it. But when you pray and you're doing those things, the answer will come. And I remember one night, and this didn't happen often, but I remember one night I've been praying with pastor for over a year without much happening at all. And the church had been through hell. The church had really been embattled. The pastor had already resigned the church and was going to leave. And he told us that night that he was going to be leaving and going to, to Winter Haven, Florida. And we've been praying now about a year. And I remember that night, we all were sitting on the altars in front of the church, and boom, a power hit those front doors of the church of Riverview. And one angel walked in off that porch and stood where Pastor always prayed. Right in behind him came another angel and stood over by the church library where I started the church library in the big bookcase there. And they stood there and they were huge angels. I'm sitting there, I'm 15 years old. There's 17 of us in the prayer meeting that night. After all the teachings of pastor, after all the prayer meetings where it felt like nothing was happening, after all the boredom, after all the wandering thoughts, after all the tiredness, I looked and there's an angel standing there and one standing there and the doors are wide open in the back and those doors were locked five ways and the doors just popped open and they came in, and they stood there for what seemed like a few minutes. And then after they just stood there for what seemed like a few minutes, the one that came in first stood out from the wall, turned like a soldier, and came to the middle aisle, and turned and walked out and disappeared into the night. Right after him, the one stepped out from the big bookcase, turned, went to the center aisle, turned like a soldier, and walked out. Let me tell you what happened. The Lord spoke to pastor that night and he said this. He said, Raymond, I don't want you to leave this church. I want you to stay here and I want you to pour into these boys. He said, because I'll use these boys in their lifetime more than you were used in your lifetime. And you're to pour into them and I'm going to use them powerfully. But don't leave, they're going to need you. And pastor told the Lord that night he wouldn't leave and he stayed. The following Wednesday night, and the church had gone through such a battle. I mean such a battle. The following Wednesday night, the church had gone down to almost nothing. The following Wednesday night, we came in. The place was packed on Wednesday night because I guess the word got out about those angels. And the place was packed out. You couldn't have got another person in the church on Wednesday night. And when pastor said, bow your heads for the offering after the songs of worship, he said, bow your heads for the offering. And when everybody bowed their head and he prayed over the offering, boom, the spirit of God fell in that place. And 38 people slid out of their seats and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Slid right out of their seats. Many of them had sought God for years for the baptism and could never receive it. And boom, they went right through to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What did that show me as a 15-year-old boy? 
What did it show me as a 15-year-old boy? It showed me that sometime when you're so bored and when you don't think you can go on, you're digging holes. Sometime you're planting poles. Sometime you're stretching wire, but oh my God, that night, a lever was pulled. And let me tell you what I saw. Those angels came in that church. They never said a word. They stood just like this right here at attention. They stood just like this. Huge. Make me look like a little child. They were huge. They never lifted a finger, never said a word. They had no wings. We didn't address them. They didn't address us. They just stood there in the dark. And you could see a power field around them. You could just see like an aura around them. And then when they left out of the church, they left the doors open. And when they left the doors open, pastor got up. We was all sitting on the altars, and pastor got up, and he was, I know what he's going to do. He's going back there to shut the doors. Well, when we walked down the aisles, and I got right in behind him, and all the rest of them did too, because we were scared. You know, I mean, we just saw angels. And here he's getting up, walking away from us, and I'm I'm, right, I'm, I'm almost knocking his shoes off his feet. I'm, I'm right on his heels. And when we got back to the front of that church in that foyer where those angels first came in, there was so much power. This is the first time I ever felt the presence of God in my life. First time I ever felt the anointing in my life. When we got back to the foyer, we all just went right down like somebody stuck fire to butter. We all just went right down in the Holy Spirit and did not come up until the next morning after the sun had come up out of the east of the stained glass windows. And those doors were still open as a reminder that those angels were there the night before. So distractions will rob you of those things, but stay faithful. Let me give you one more and I'll close. Physical exhaustion. Just stay with me for another few minutes. I'm about to close. Physical exhaustion. There's another way that Satan will try to interrupt you, and that's with wearing you out. The Bible said in the last days that the spirit of the Antichrist will wear out the saints of the Most High. Many people today that I hear the word and the refrain from them is I'm so tired. I am so tired. I am so weary. I am so weary. I wish the Lord would come. I am so weary. I am so weary in dealing with my family. I'm so weary with the things on my job. I'm so weary with the things going on in my ministry. I hear it all the time, and the Bible said that that Spirit of the Antichrist is there to wear down the saints of the Most High. People live tired today. Prayer was never meant to be a burden for you. God never ordained prayer to be something to wear you out and to add to your stress. Prayer is supposed to be there as a vehicle for encouragement and strength. Satan will devise energy draining things that will drain you down, such as traffic delays, such as you had to do some extra running around to get your job done and it took a lot longer than you anticipated. You arrive home, you're worn out, you're tired. When you get home, there's things that your wife has got for you that has to be done. It has to be done, and only you can do it. Then you have unexpected errands that you've got to do after you arrive home, just constant running about, and they drain you down. I remember in Revival, when Revival first broke out at Brownsville, Rich, Rick Joyner came to see me and Steve, and he said, I'm not here so much for the Revival, but I'm here for you guys. And we went in the back, back there in a special area, and he said, the Lord sent me here to tell you guys that the thing you're going to have to really watch in revival as you're pastoring this revival, you're going to have to watch weariness. You're going to have to watch weariness. He said, because weariness is what ends revival 
The anointing is not, the lifting of the anointing is not what ends revival. It's weariness where you can't go any further. It's mental weariness. It's mental anxiety. It's mental straining, wonder how you're going to get it all done. How's it going to work out? How's this going to pan out? It's mental weariness. And he said, the Lord said for me to come by here and lay hands on you both and pray for you that you will be able to deal with the weariness, the physical and the mental weariness. And so finally, my last point is this. A storm of accusations. A storm of accusations. This is my last point, and I'm going to close in just a moment. After Brownsville was dedicated, it was brilliant and beautiful. Everything was just so pretty, clean, brand new church, got it dedicated. I went down to the church on Saturday to pray. And I remember I locked the doors to the church sanctuary and outside and inside. And I laid down on the floor looked under all the pews to make sure nobody was in there. Because I wanted to cry out to God and I didn't want anybody to hear me because I was going to pray some private stuff. So I just began to pour my heart out to the Lord. And I said, God. I said, Lord, I have every reason in the world to be happy, the happiest man on the earth. I said, but God, I'm so lonely. Why am I so lonely? I said, Lord, I just feel so alone. I said, my wife loves me. My children are great kids. The church loves me. I'm on television around the world. I have no church problems. God, why am I so lonely? And I remember I had him ask that question, and the Lord came back at me, and he said, he answered me like this. He said, if you will make this a house of prayer, I will pour out my spirit here. And he was letting me know that was the answer to my loneliness. And I came back to the Lord. I figured if Moses could do it, I was going to try it. And I came back to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I said, you know the prayer meetings is the least attended church, church services of the whole week. You know, Lord. Prayer meetings, they just, people don't come out. They're not attend- And the Holy Spirit interrupted me, and he said, I'll give you a plan. It's like that. Well, I got up. And I was going back to the foyer. I was going to the restroom. When I got back to the foyer before my hands could even touch the doors, I mean in two seconds, that quick, before my hands could touch those doors, the Lord gave me a download of prayer banners. And there were 12 of them. And the Lord showed them to me, and he said, I want you to have these prayer banners made up, and there will be prayer titles. And when you dismiss the crowd on Sunday nights, the people can begin to move around at these prayer banners, and if they spend five minutes around a prayer banner, around that title, if they pray five minutes there, it's five times 12 is 60, they'll pray an hour. And I said, oh, okay, wow. So I did it, and I had the banners made up. I had ladies that made them, and they were beautiful. They were gorgeous. They were big, and they were knockout. I mean, they were gorgeous. So the time came to start these prayer banners. Prayer, prayer ministry. I told the church we're going to do away with preaching on Sunday night. Oh my God, that, you know, you don't do away with preaching in the deep south on Sunday night. That was the evangelism service. That's where you get people saved. That's where people bring their neighbors. That's where you receive the Holy Spirit. And the Lord said, I want you to make this a house of prayer. And he said, I want you to do it on Sunday night. I said, oh my God. So, what happened was, I had all these made up. I announced it. I said, this coming Sunday night, we're going to have praise and worship. We're going to take the offering and then we're going to dismiss everybody and we're going to go and we're going to start having prayer banners. And I had a prayer, a homeroom banner leader that was around each banner and when people would gather, they'd take five minutes, only five minutes and just tell everybody what they were going to be praying about that night like a homeroom banner, what the prayer requests were. And so after prayer, after five minutes of Telling what the prayer needs were, they brought up the background music. It was it was piped in music, powerful, powerful Pentecostal music. 
and it was, it was prayer music, and they'd bring that up, and they'd know to hush. Now it's time for people to pray. And people would move from banner to banner and pray five minutes. Well, it wasn't no time. The church was praying two hours. They were praying 10 minutes around each prayer bell. I had one for souls. I had one for schools. Brenda had the revival banner. My wife had the revival banner. There were 12 of them. And if the congregation migrated from banner to banner and took five minutes, it was an hour. But now they were praying over two hours. But listen to this. The first night came for us to have prayer. I am a nervous wreck. It was like a little demon jumped up on my shoulder, like a little monkey demon. It was just like a little monkey demon jumped up on my shoulder, just so his mouth would be in my ear. And he said, you better stop this. If you don't stop this, you're going to lose your crowd. You better stop it now. You know people's not going to come in here every Sunday night and pray. You know that. You know that prayer is the least intended service of the whole week. You better stop it right now. And man, when I dismissed the service, I went up on the edge of the steps like that right there. And I looked down at the crowd when I dismissed them. And I stood there. And I was a nervous wreck. I didn't know how many people was going to leave. I thought they're going to go to Cracker Barrel. You know, a lot of people's going to leave and go fellowship with Cracker Barrel. They're not going to stay and pray. Well, I only saw maybe like four to six people leave. Listen, that demon stayed on my shoulder for a year. Every Sunday night, I knew what was coming. And though the people wasn't leaving and they were staying and they were actually praying and doing what the Lord told me to do, they were actually staying and praying, that demon stayed on my shoulder and he was... It was a distraction, and I was nervous. I was anxious. I had impending visions of disaster, and we're in there praying. We're praying for revival, and for the first year, that demon, you better stop it. I mean, you better stop it now. If you don't stop it, how many of you knows if the devil's lips is moving, he's lying? You know what happened? One, about a year later, Holy Spirit spoke to me, and here's what he said, and it was over. He said, I'm about to pour out my spirit in this place. And as soon as the Lord said that, it was all done. That demon never came back. That demon never whispered in my ear again. We were well underway. Well, revival wasn't going to break out for a year and a half later. It was going to be a year and a half more before revival was going to break out. But we continued to pray. Every distraction you can imagine came my way. Every distraction came my wife's way. Every distraction came the people in Brownsville's way to keep them out of that prayer meeting on Saturday night. I began to teach it. I began to preach it. I began to explain what was going on. And people warred past it. And we got revival after two and a half years. Now listen, I'm going to give you three things before I let you go. These are very quick, won't take five minutes. We'll give you three things real quickly that I want to tell you how that you can be ready to face these situations. Number one, in order to understand what you're going through, in order to, un to be prepared for this conspiracy of interruptions, number one, make Communing with God this year, make communing with God in prayer your priority for your life this year. Make that your number one priority, to commune with the Lord. It must come, this decision must come because it may be the difference between life and death of your family your church and the things that are dear to you. Prayer and Bible study must not be considered optional any longer. You're going to have to see it with the seriousness of which God is showing it to you. That's why he sent me here this morning. Our most effective work for God is done on our knees or walking around in prayer. I don't kneel when I pray. I always walk around when I pray. But you've got to make it a priority in your life to start communing with God this year 
more than you ever have before. You may not be perfect at it, but keep going and overcome every discrepancy and every distraction. Number two, consider your appointment with God more sacred than any other appointment that you have during the week. Consider your appointment with God more sacred than any other appointment. You may have to take those appointments, like a doctor's appointment or appointment to see someone or whatever. You may have to take those appointments, but consider your appointment with God more sacred and be more committed to that appointment than any other appointment that you have all week. You must recognize the trifling small things that keep us away from God these trifling things keep us away from his greatness. And they're just trifle things, small things. They feel so important that we want to obey them, but they're just trifle, small things. I love the scripture in Job. It says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, I have considered his words out of his mouth more than my necessary food. And then number three, this is the last one. Rise up and take dominion over interruptions. Rise up and take dominion over interruptions. Some interruptions are our own doing. Some are not, but most are trivial. They're trivial. Realize you're never at the mercy of Satan. You don't have to worry about pleasing Satan. You don't have to worry about paying attention to these interruptions. You're not obligated to pay attention to his interruptions. He's trying to get your attention. He's clamoring for your attention. But don't feel bad if you don't give him that attention. You're in this thing to expose the devil's tactics. So rise up with the mindset that I'm going to go after God this year. I'm going to go to the prayer closet this year and I'm going to seek God for revival like I never have before. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you just slip your hands up in the air for a moment? Let's just wait in his presence. I want you to just digest for a moment the things you've heard. I want you to think about it because what I've delivered to you this morning is very, very important. It's important to the heart of God. As a matter of fact, let me just ask this question. If you would take a few minutes, I know it's Sunday morning, I know you got a busy day, but if you could just take just a few minutes, those of you that would be willing to slip out of your seat and say, Brother Kilpatrick, I heard you, and I realize there's a conspiracy against me and my family, and I know that the devil is fighting against me, and I know he's trying to keep me out of my prayer closet. He's trying to keep me out of going after God in revival. And I made up my mind, I'm not going to let that happen. I want you to step out from where you are. And let's just slide forward here for a moment, spend a moment in prayer. Just stand, don't kneel, just stand. Come on. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. We're going to see, yeah. I'm going to see a victory, yeah. I'm going to see a victory, yeah. for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing it out from your spirit. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle. We're gonna see, 
stand faithful and faithful. We're going to see. We cry out to you, God. Yes, Lord. And we believe you take. Yes, Lord. You take yes, Lord. the enemy yes, Lord. meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, just prophesy that this morning. That you take what the enemy meant for evil. Yeah. And you turn it for good. He will do that. You yeah. turn it for good. Yes, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Yeah. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. this message today? How many of you already the devil started in on you? Can I see your hand? But you know what? It doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. The devil's come against me also. That's a good sign. Because if he's coming against you, it's a good sign that he knows something good's going to come from you. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask the Lord to keep you and protect you. But I want you to Repeat a prayer after me first, if you will. And uh, I want to just have no music here for just a few moments. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. come on, pray it out like you mean it. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. I, come to you, I come to you, and I repent, and I repent of, the many times of the many times that I have given in, have given in to, the the to the wiles of the devil and the interruptions and the distractions. But Father, here today, today, by the help of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, I'm going to go afresh. I'm going to go go anew. I'm going to to seek you. I'm going to to my prayer closet. closet. And I will stay. stay. And I will not be distracted. distracted. And I will not be dissuaded until the victory comes. I ask you, Lord, give me the strength of your Holy Spirit. Give me the insight and the discernment to know when these things are coming against me. And give me the strength to overcome it in Jesus' name. And I pray for all of you right now that you won't put off any longer what you know God's dealing with you about. Don't put off any, any longer. You're only putting off the inevitable anyway. God's waiting on you. He's not waiting on you with his wristwatch to see if you're going to pray a certain amount of time. He's not even waiting to see if you're going to be tardy or absent or present. He's not waiting for that reason. He's waiting to spend time with you to bless you and to strengthen you and to encourage you. So Holy Spirit, I pray for evangel today. Lord, I know that there is a damnable distraction of interruptions aimed against this church and its leadership, especially against this leadership. And I pray for them, Lord. I intercede for them right now. And I ask, Lord, that a fresh wind of your spirit will begin to blow in this church. A fresh anticipation and a fresh vision of what God has for this church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, one more time, let's thank Pastor Kilpatrick for such a good word this morning. We need that, amen? I'm going to read the ironic blessing in just a second. In closing, I want to encourage you, sow into this word. 
sow into this word. We need this word. We need words that will help align us with the things of God. Amen. Aligns our spirit with spirit, truth with truth, pe things that will help keep us on the path to the plans and the destiny that God has in store for our lives because he has good plans and a good purpose for our lives. Don't forget, he will be back tonight speaking in our 6 p.m. service as well. If you would, slip up your hands. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son, saying, thus you shall bless the people of God. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of God and I will bless them. Father, we bless your people today. God, we thank you for the power of your word. And I pray, Father, that we would be steadfast, we'd be vigilant, wise as serpent, innocent as doves, God, is what your word says, to be able to discern the things that the enemy would have to try to distract us from the plans you have in store for us. Bless your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.